for tonight, what, what we plan to do was uh, to have, uh, to give the opportunity to some members of the club to explain what they collect, what type of topics they collect. Uh, one of the purposes of uh, meeting together is, is uh, also to give the, the possibility to uh, everybody to know what uh, everybody else collects, because this, this uh, allows the possibility of suggestions, of exchanges, of other things like that. I will let uh, Ingo share the screen first and uh, explain. I won't even say what you collect, Ingo, so it's a big surprise the moment that you, you start talking about it, because I'm sure nobody knows about it. So this is a, a, a first. So I'm going to talk about a very joyful, light-hearted topic that I started getting interested in. It's a very personal thing. Um, and uh, it's, it is it is lighthearted and joyful, but it also has some significant history to it and some, and you can go very deep into this subject. Um, I fell in love with sheep and um, I did so, and this, like I say, is very personal. When I got married, I married a girl who is from a little hilltop town in central southern Italy where shepherds are still going around and where where the sheep industry is still prevalent although it's changing a lot and all the old uh, ways have changed but anyways i i started to like sheep and um about 10 years ago i thought you know what i like that animal so much and the scenes of uh, a flock of sheep on the side of a hill let me just start accumulating stamps with sheep on them and then I started accumulating covers with sheep on them. And then I started finding names of towns that were sheep related. And next thing I know, I'm a topical collector. I am i don't call myself a topical collector. I'm an accumulator. I haven't done anything to put this in order. This um, eight slide show is just examples of stuff that I've collected and a little narrative to go with it. But uh, I will probably get serious about it for maybe exhibiting purposes at some point in my life. But right now, I'm just having fun with collecting these little woolly guys. So um, sheep are a very historic uh, animal that um, has created a lot of wealth uh, in many societies back in, in to early history. Um, they've been used for many purposes not just their wool but meat and food products and and even something as beneficial as lanolin um, and uh, and many other products and so pretty well every country in the every stamp issuing entity in the world has issued something with sheep um, and so i just picked a few different stamps to show um, you can find you can find hundreds of them. I found out from the American Topical Association that there's over a thousand sheep stamps listed in Scots. I'm sure it's even more than that. But anyways, I just picked a few that I have. This top one here, top right corner from Faroe Islands, is an absolutely fantastic um, engraving by the master engraver Slanya Czesław Slanya. And I just, I just love his work, and I love that portrayal of a ram with those curly horns. Um, down in the bottom left is uh, a sort of happy one of sheep leaping. They, when sheep run in droves, a lot of them try to leap, and um, I don't even understand why they do that, because they sometimes have accidents and hit their buddies or fall down and sometimes injure themselves. But anyway, sheep like to leap. So I got that Afghan uh, agriculture stamp from 1963. Um, sheep are also used as symbols, and I found a Swedish private post stamp that uh, has a sheep on its coat of arms. And uh, they're, they're frequently found on coat of arms, and they're also a religious symbol as the Lamb of God in the Christian religion. Um, there's lots of stamps that depict them. I just gave some examples of some of my favorite ones. Australia is a major sheep country with probably the most uh, uh, sheep quantities in the world. They have um, ranches. They call them stations. 
and they're measured by square kilometers instead of hectares or square miles or, or, or acres because they're so huge. Um, and they're famous for merino sheep, merino wool being one of the really good wools to uh, make uh, clothing with. Um, the Falkland Islands is another major sheep country. They don't have much else there because uh, it's just a couple of a group of islands off uh, in the South Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but apparently they've got great grazing pastures for sheep, so they're, that's their major industry there. And they've issued a lot of different stamps with sheep on them. This is the very first one of that country from 1933 when they were celebrating 100 years of uh, British, uh, British uh, colonialism. Um, and the lower one is a more uh, artistic one. It's a, a Vatican City stamp that uh, showed a lamb drinking from a stream in mosaic. And mosaics were used in, in uh, ancient churches to depict biblical scenes. And uh, it uh, is again talking to the Lamb of God. Um, of course, the Chinese New Year um, cycle, the Chinese zodiac has a 12 year cycle and one of the years is always either called the ram or the sheep. And in 2003, uh, Niafu, which is uh, part of the Tonga Islands, uh, issued a Chinese New Year stamp for the year of the sheep. And I like the depictions of them with the sort of just black and white uh, pictures of the animals on a colorful background. Um, there's lots of uh, sheep stamps from Chinese New Year and Canada has also is issued some beautiful ones. Um, the next one is uh, my favorite country where I first started to notice and, and, and appreciate sheep and that is Italy. Um, this one is from a 1950 definitive issue, which I, I really like that definitive issue. It depicts all the different occupations of workmen and, and women in Italy. And um, they picked Sardinia as the one for shepherds, but it could have been any region in Italy. It could have been Abruzzo, Molise, uh, Apulia. There's sheep all over that country but they decided to pick Sardinia, so that's fine. And I, I love that picture of the shepherd leading his flock. Uh, shepherds have hard lives. They, 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 it's not an easy job. And uh, we'll come to that in a minute. But I also got this stamp on cover in a strip of three. It's a nice local uh, registered cover within the city of Torino addressed to somebody named Werkmiller and off topic, um, Lina Wertmiller, a famous uh, Italian uh, Italian filmmaker, recently died. And I remember she had some great uh, movies in the 70s that I used to appreciate in my student days. So uh, multiple interests on that cover. And uh, yeah, so this one takes us to the uh, transhumance, which is the seasonal movement of in my case, sheep, but it could be any kind of livestock, cattle, reindeer, uh, llamas. Uh, in mountainous regions where they have sheep, um, they, they send the sheep to the high parts of the mountains or the hilltops in summer so that they could graze there. And then when it gets cold in winter, they, they, they move them back down to the valley. And those marches are sometimes very long. They're like, they, they can take up to days and weeks of, of marching the sheep down, driving the sheep down with sheep dogs, helping the shepherds do that. And you could see with that French stamp there, it's, it's masses, massive quantities of, of animals that get moved from pasture to pasture. And it's a tough life. It's an interesting job, but very, very much living outdoors with your animals for the for a whole season. Uh, and there's all kinds of details to that job, like uh, little houses that they built that were, they weren't houses, they were shelters uh, that the shepherds would live in and they'd just be shared accommodation for whoever was passing by there. And there's a region in Southern Italy in Apulia 
where they have the old uh, circular houses which were based on the shepherd's huts and um, there's all kinds of story to it. You can go pretty deep into studying uh, the movement of sheep. And then, of course, if you're getting really into your subject as a topical, you don't just want to collect them on stamps or on cover, but you want to collect cancels from towns that have a sheep-related name. So Mutton Bay is one example. There's, there's lots of them around. Uh, I know there's a Port Mattoon in uh, Nova Scotia, but this one from Mutton Bay I like because I looked up where that is and it's in a very, very remote area of Quebec on the north shore of the Lawrence, uh, St. Lawrence River. So far east, it's almost at the border of Labrador. So it's a very remote community called Mutton Bay and uh, a little thought of sheep uh, that must have been sent there when the first settlers went. So um, I'm going to end it with a little bit of humor to say thank you for listening. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm a lover of sheep. Yeah, I'm going to be a little sheepish here. Oh, no. and, and talk about um, postal and philatelic museums. Um, this is one of uh, 52 museum categories that I've, that I've been able to... Uh, to work on over the past four or five years. And I was just curious to see just how many of the, you know, postal museums I, I could find. And um, so far I've, over the four or five years, I've collected about 200 items, both, you know, stamps, sets, first day covers, souvenir sheets, maxi cards, um, booklets, et cetera. Um, and I've managed to get them from about 46 different countries. Oh. So the, the first one is uh, Canada's, Toronto's um, first post office, which is really the fourth iteration of that post office. And sadly and ironically, it's the only postal museum that Canada has since the one up in Gatineau closed and we may never see it again. But this, uh, this building, which is very historic, uh, it not only has a, a postal collection, but it uh, tells the story of um, our colonial postal system of Toronto's first post office or postmaster and uh, interprets the town of York. So it's uh, yeah, for Toronto, especially, it's very important. Uh, the one beside it is for the, the um, Arab Postal Museum and Arab League. And it's, it's one of an omnibus series that uh, has at least eight stamps of the same, uh, same design. Uh, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and uh, the UA part of Syria. And the only one I'm missing is the UAR one. Um, so it's, uh, and it was issued in 1960. Uh, to back up to the to the Canadian one, obviously it's, it's for the Capex, which is which is very appropriate for this year because there'll be another Capex in June. This one is uh, an Indonesian one, uh, which opened in 1983 and was built in the what they call the Japanese Balinese style, and um, it's a very attractive building. And I've discovered that. Inside, it has uh, seven presentation rooms of all different, fa different facets of in Indonesian stamps. Uh, like a lot of other postal museums around the world, it, um, it tries to be as attractive to children as possible. The Mauritius one came out in, in 2005. And it's an historic building that's in the, the Port Louis, which is the capital at its, at its waterfront. It's another um, historical attractive building. The Singapore one uh, to the right there uh, came out in 1995, which is when it opened. It's a set of four and it was housed in a, a century old colonial building. I just discovered today that the Postal Museum has closed and it'll be reopening as a children's museum. 
But there, there again, its emphasis when they opened it and throughout its its history or short history, um, tried to be as attractive to children as possible. And and I think probably what they'll do with within the children's museum is to continue, hopefully, continue to have a a, a postal history or, or philatelic uh, component. Um, besides these stamps, um, most of the stamps I have. Uh, depict um, contents, whether it's or collections, whether it's vehicles, art, mailboxes, uh, mailmen, or couriers, and whatever. Some of the stamps are for openings, some are for anniversaries, and some are for the various activities. And some combine uh, post office and telecommunications. And the odd one it combines uh, philatelic and numismatic topics. I guess the last thing I have to say is that the, the U.S. Postal Museum is part of the Smithsonian complex. As everyone knows, um, I collect bird stamps and I have about 20,000 of them, but um, I've just started specialising in woodpeckers because they're one of my favourite birds. And the ivory-billed woodpecker, which I depicted here on stamps from Cuba, uh, fascinating because they've just been um, declared extinct by the US Fish and Wildlife Service but there's great conjecture as to whether they are still alive or if any are still alive in the um, mainland of the United States or Cuba. Um, there is a subspecies in Cuba which they believe also may or may not be extinct. So these first um, Cuban ones were, I'll just give you a little background on the, the size and shape and sound of the birds because um, most of us are familiar with the size of, say, um, a North American crow um, or even a pileated woodpecker, which um, are relatively still abundant around Toronto and northwards. Um, and cottage country. So this bird is roughly marginally bigger. It's about 20 inches long. Um, it's very distinctive. It has um, black and white markings and the white markings on the wings uh, what give it its sort of diagnostic um, recognition. And they were shot for their um, beauty because they were big, easy targets to um, to aim for and they were collected by um, museums, they were collected by people who, or even the fashion industry many years ago. So they also make um, a very distinctive um, double knock called a Kent, a Kent knocking or Kent sound. Um, and it's like all the, um, woodpeckers in their family, they have it sounds like a bam bam when they hear it. It's very loud and very distinctive. Um, they also lived in the bottomwood swamps of uh, sort of uh, mostly in Louisiana, Florida, Arkansas, um, parts of Texas, but they got uh, extirpated or have been. Um, They've moved further, they kept moving further south the more that their forests were annihilated. So, first of all, in John James Audubon in um, 1821, he went, um, he painted the ivory billed woodpeckers, um, which came part of his book. And he used to shoot birds before he ever painted them. And they were his specimens. He had them in his hand so he could um, draw from them and then paint them. Um, as uh, around 1913 in um, Madison Parish in uh, northeastern Louisiana, um, the Singer Sewing Machine Company bought 80,000 acres of land. And this included bottomwood swamps and a swampy, swampy forests of where the ivory billed woodpecker inhabited. And uh, the Trees were just decimated and there were massive um, cypress trees and 
uh, pine trees. Um, they were all decimated because the Singer Sewing Machine Company wanted to make sewing machine cabinets and also shipping crates to send their products around the world. So this massive big forest of dense trees where these birds lived um, were getting decimated and the birds moved, kept moving further south. Um, in 1924, in Florida, a guy called oh, Arthur Allen um, went on a sabbatical to Florida to try and find ivory-billed woodpeckers that hadn't been heard of for almost 100 years, and that was in 1924. Well, by luck, he found a pair of mated, uh, a mated pair of ivory-bills who were about to nest and he thought he'd leave them alone for a couple of weeks to let them nest in peace so they wouldn't be spooked by humans. He came back a couple of weeks later only to find that the pair had been shot by a taxidermist who had learned of his sightings. And the taxidermist then sold them uh, to a museum. So that was in 1924. Then in 1932, um, back in Louisiana, um, a, uh, a politician in Louisiana went to what's known as the Singer Tract. So that's where the Singer Sewing Machine Company had, had their property. Um, it became known as the Singer Tract and he had shot um, an ivory-billed woodpecker. Then the, there were six more were found at that time. So that was back in 1932. And then in 1937, um, a Cornell um, University student, where the, there's a Cornell Lab of Ornithology for the study of birds, um, a guy called James Tanner, he lived in a, a little um, shack in the woods in the Singer Tract for about a year to study the ivory-billed woodpecker because nobody knew much about their habits. So this is to give you an idea of sort of the coloration, the one on the left, um, the stamp on the left says uh, A's auto, auto, no, no, auto, tonus. it means um, indigenous birds of Cuba. All the stamps are from Cuba, there are none from the United States, um, but the male is the one with the red crest and the female is the one with the black crest. And and they eat um, wood boring lava, uh, beetle lava. So the giant bug, uh, grubs are in decaying wood. And so they would use their chisel like beaks to um, hammer open the wood to get at the beetles, uh, beetle lava. They'll also eat other insects as well, but that was sort of their favorite food. And then um, the Singer Sewing Machine Company started selling off the forest that they owned to lumber mills, two lumber mills. So therefore the forest was decreasing at a very fast rate. And then it came down to, um, in, in 1944 was the last recognized um, holding of the birds where they were last seen and depicted. Um, oh, James Tanner, I should add, had taken one of the few photographs ever of a pair of ivory-billed woodpeckers. There aren't that many around. And there is a short video of, or, um, sorry, a movie, um, black and white movie of them. Um, there have been reported sightings um, since 1944. There are about 22 documented sightings, but they're not all proven. Um, the scientific community won't believe people who've either seen birds just um, visually or through binoculars. They want hard evidence like um, a movie, um, video cam, um, digital photograph would be really nice in this day and age. Um, back in 2004 in uh, Louisiana, oh, yeah, in Louisiana, um, a guy called Gene Spaulding was kayaking in the bottom woods um, in or near the White Creek National Wildlife Reserve in a place called Bayou de Vue. And he said he'd found 
what he believed was an ivory-billed woodpecker, but he didn't believe his sighting because he thought that birds were extinct. But judging by his description, they sent it to the Cornell lab in New York and the uh, one of the ornithologists from there went, went with another guy called Bobby Harrison, uh, or the ornithologist was Tim Gallagher, and two weeks after they had had Gene Spaulding's um, report, they went down to um, the same area to look for ivory builds, and this was the big fuss in 2004 when they said, oh, it's been rediscovered. Well, they took a four-second video, believe it or not, at only four seconds, um, and it's very um, open to debate, even by the scientific community, whether it's actually ivory-billed woodpecker um, being rediscovered or if it's actually um, the smaller pileated woodpecker because when they're flying, they look very similar because of their basic black and white appearance. In the stamp on the right, um, you can't. The, obviously, the bird in the foreground is um, is a what do they call it um, a red macaw, or Cuban macaw, and this is an endemic species. But if you look under his tail, you'll see the ivory-billed woodpecker. Um, he's on display in a sort of like in a museum, and I believe there, there's face of a guy there. Um, underneath to the left hand side, I believe it might be Gundlach, who is a Cuban ornithologist who did a study on Cuban ivory bill woodpeckers. Um, he's got a beard there, but I've never seen him <laughs> with a beard. But I believe that's him, but not 100% sure. So this is sort of more what an ivory build would look like if we saw him today. He would. He looks very similar to our pileated, and he has the big white um, line from his cheek down his back, and it forms like a V on his back. And he has big white um, secondaries, or primaries and secondaries, which are these feathers. Um, so it would be nice to say that he's still alive, but um, as of September, um, yeah, 2021, the US Fish and Wildlife Service said that it was extinct. Now, when a bird becomes extinct, that means all the um, funding for it, for it, looking for it, searching for it, um, gets cut off. So there are a lot of people who still think that um, they haven't given it enough time from the possible sighting in 2004 until now um, to say that the bird is 100% extinct. So there is a possibility if you're in the southern woods in Louisiana and you want to go looking for a very rare bird, um, you can go and go through the bottomwood swamps where there are cotton mouse snakes and all kinds of creatures, that are big and small, and masses of uh, mosquitoes, depending on what time of the year you go. So that's about it. Um, there are only five stamps from Cuba of an ivory-billed woodpecker. Um, I only collect the stamps from the country that they belong in. Um, there are about um, yeah, eight, eight other countries that have issued uh, ivory-billed woodpecker stamps, but I don't collect them because they don't belong there. Um, like Benin or Hungary or even depictions of... Um, Ojibwan's ivory bill woodpecker reproduced on stamps. So I don't necessarily collect them from other countries, only from the countries they should be in. So either USA or uh, Cuba. So that's about it. Thank you. In the upper left hand corner is a United States C 13 semi postal stamp of 65 cents, uh, depicting, depicting a Zeppelin over uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it was issued. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, my talk is on Zeppelin stamps, which over my shoulder is a Zeppelin waiting for me to board in Frederick shop in Germany a few, a few years ago. Um, the, uh, the stamp was issued uh, April 19th, 1930, and it was part of a three-stamp series, three series 
of 65 cents, a dollar, dollar 30 and a dollar 60. The upper right hand corner is a uh, German uh, Zeppelin stamp. Uh, it is uh, an overprint of a similar stamp, uh, both that were issued earlier in, uh, in the two mark and the four mark denomination. The overprint came out in September 25th, 1933. And also a um, one uh, de de Deutschmark Carmen uh, color and a four Deutschmark black black brown uh, were also issued and this was to commemorate the 1933 world's fair in which the, uh, the zeppelin did make a, uh, a flight two um, the bottom two stamps are uh, stamps from uh, Liechtenstein. Uh, the left hand one is uh, the c7 and it is a uh, picture of the um, uh, zeppelin over the uh, na 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 Cuffed Falkland Range. And the right hand one is a two uh, franc C8, and it's over the Vanula Valley. Both of these stamps were issued in 1931 on uh, June 1st. This is a uh, cover uh, issued, uh, well, there's two stamps issued. One is a Zeppelin uh, cover, and the other one is a uh, the, the one Deutschmark German Eagle. The German Eagle was issued April 1st, 1927, and the Ford, Ford Deutschmark overprint. Um, and that was an overprint uh, commemorating the first flight of the Graf Zeppelin to uh, South America. The uh, cover is tied to Frederick Chauvin, uh, dated April 18th, 1930, with a circle date stamp. And the addressee is in Springfield, Massachusetts, and the confirmation stamp is in red in the uh, lower left. The flight departed Frederick Schaffen uh, April 18th, 1930 with numerous legs to Seville, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Recife, and uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey. The left-hand stamp is one of my favorite stamps and it is um, it is the only Zeppelin stamp issued in Canada. And um, it is a semi-official airmail stamp issued by the Aero Club of Canada in August of 1918. And it depicts the uh, uh, Zeppelin uh, in flames, uh, uh, likely about to crash. Uh, two versions of this stamp exist. The CLP-1 has no denomination. You see the denomination of 25 cents in the bottom left and bottom right-hand corners. And the CL CLP2 has the uh, shows the denomination in uh, in the bottom corners. Many varieties of uh, both of those stamps do exist. The uh, right hand stamp is a um, from the uh, Saint Vincent and Grenadines. Grenadines, it's a souvenir sheet. The number is uh, 3513 A, B, and C, and it depicts three stamps, and they're four dollars each. The top airship is the uh, USS. Uh, Akron. The middle stamp is the uh, A-70 airship and the bottom stamp depicts the um, Altair-Z uh, experimental airship. And uh, the portrait uh, to the right on the uh, souvenir sheet is of Ludwig Durer. And he was a uh, chief engineer for the Zeppelin company and he led all but the very earliest airship construction. I don't think that um, uh, you know about this this uh, collection of mine. I am a little bit like Ingo. I I accumulate everything which is connected with agricultural machinery, but uh, I have not really gone beyond doing that. So I've not uh, tried to 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 make an exhibit of it or try to 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 collect them in a very organized way, but. Uh, uh, I've been working in agriculture machinery business for about 35 years. So uh, there, is, there is a particular affection there. And whenever I see a stamp which has got some connection with, uh, with uh, agriculture machinery, or even construction uh, equipment, uh, I end up uh, uh, putting them aside. The same with uh, covers, with uh, special cancels and so on. And they're just... Uh, Keep them in a box, and one day probably I will go 
uh, to the next step of trying to organize uh, my collection a little bit better. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with agriculture machinery, but the, the, the most important piece of equipment in agriculture machinery is in the agricultural tractor. And uh, uh, because of that, uh, uh, there are uh, hundreds of stamps of agricultural tractors, while instead it's quite difficult to find stamps of other agricultural machinery. Basically, the agricultural tractor is, uh, is uh, the piece of equipment which pulls everything else. So there are a lot of uh, different implements of different type of machines which are pulled by, by a tractor. And that's why it's very popular in, uh, in a lot of countries and uh, uh, they've been shown in, uh, in uh, different stamps. But particularly in the old Eastern Bloc countries because uh, agricultural tractors uh, uh, were uh, uh, one of the major productions that those countries had. So they, they were one of the symbol of their uh, industrial capacity. So, they, they were issued quite a few stamps of, uh, of um, uh, de depicting uh, agricultural tractors. Uh, the, the, the tractors, even at a certain point, were uh, pulling uh, combines, which is uh, a piece of equipment which is uh, much more sophisticated, much more expensive than a tractor, and uh, which today it's uh, sold only as a self-propelled unit, but in the old times, they were attached behind the tractor and the tractor would, uh, would um, pull this huge piece of equipment uh, uh, through the fields. Uh, now the, the tractors originally were uh, two wheel drive. So you see here the, this uh, Romanian tractor, which is um, a, a two wheel drive tractor. And then uh, with time they evolved in four wheel drive. And now basically the majority of the tractors because the type of terrain they're working in they are four-wheel drive. But the four-wheel drive is a relatively new discovery because they were introduced in the 1960s or like that. Before, there were only two-wheel drive tractors. A curiosity uh, is that in the Eastern Bloc, basically every country had its own brand of tractors. So while the major manufacturers are from, today are from the Western Bloc, so, you know, John Deere, I, I worked with uh, the Fiat group, which owned then New Holland, which was Ford New Holland, and then Case, uh, which was Case International Harvester. So th those are the major, major companies. But in the past, in terms of uh, unit production, the countries of the Eastern Bloc uh, were producing a very, very large number of tractors uh, because the, the, basically the the way that uh, the old system worked was that uh, they would produce uh, uh, tractors uh, in uh, large quantity for the, for the farms. Uh, they had a defect to which they would never manufacture spare parts. So the problem was the, the life uh, of, of a tractor was relatively short. And whenever they would break down, basically would replace them with a new one. So, um, the, the tractors here are from Romania. The, the plant was called Universal Tractor Brazov, UTB. And uh, now this is, uh, doesn't exist anymore or anyway, not in the form uh, and in the size that it was uh, before the 1990. And one interesting tractor is this one, which is uh, what is called in French, uh, Enjambeur. Uh, that means uh, it's a tractor which goes uh, on top of the plants. Um, and uh, this is used for treatments uh, in the, in the uh, vineyards, uh, on particular fruit uh, trees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these two pieces of equipment here are what they're called the construction equipment, which is uh, a different uh, type of equipment, not used for agriculture, but uh, for construction. And, and they're moving. Okay, so the, the other one here is um, a tractor from Poland. And uh, the, the company in Poland was called Ursus. And uh, 
was was also a very large uh, very large uh, tractor manufacturer before 1990 and then gradually closed down around 1995 it closed down um, the one on the right is uh, uh, showing tractors from belarus and uh, the the tractors built in belarus uh, they were called belarus so a lot of fantasy there uh, i chose this this uh, souvenir sheet because it's uh, the only one that shows the inside of a plant. So this, this shows the production line where, uh, where the tractors were assembled. The uh, manufacturing plants uh, in, East, in the Eastern Bloc were extremely basic, uh, very poor working conditions, but uh, still they produced a, a very, very large number of tractors. Each of these plants would produce 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 tractors a year. There is a particular type of tractor, which is uh, the crawler tractor. Um, the crawler tractors are particularly indicated for uh, working in particularly difficult terrain. And they also have a characteristic that uh, they, depending on the type of shoes that you have on the tractor, you can reach uh, some conditions where the, the ground pressure is um, lower than uh, a person foot. So the, the tractors can float in certain conditions. In fact, in Ireland, the crawler tractors are used by Bornamona, which is a, 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 a specific uh, uh, organization which works in the, in the uh, areas where there is peat. And, uh, and they, they can float uh, basically in, in, uh, that, uh, in those places while instead people would not be able to walk through the same fields. The, the uh, crawler tractors uh, shown here, there is one shown in China, which is pulling uh, some, some uh, equipment on the back. And um, uh, the other one is in Canada, a similar type of uh, utilization for, um, for um, cutting um, uh, fodder. Then, uh, there are the combine harvesters. Uh, combine harvesters, uh, as I explained to you, initially were pulled of a pull type, namely they were attached to tractors, but then they become self-propelled. So they had their own engine and their own driver, and uh, they are used for a lot of purposes from uh, uh, harvesting wheat to corn, to soya beans, uh, to rice. Uh, the one for rice is uh, to be uh, a particular machine because uh, of the conditions uh, 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 of the fields, uh, of the rice fields, which require a particular uh, uh, preparation for the machines. Uh, but they are uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, pieces of equipment, very, very uh, fast nowadays. And, uh, and you will see one on the, on the right here. Uh, which is uh, one, a modern combine harvest. That's what modern combine harvesters look like. The one on the left, uh, I put it there because it's, uh, it's a Polish uh, combine harvester, Bison. And uh, I've been working with this company for about 10 years. So I have a lot of memories there. So I wanted to, to put this one in, in, in one of the slides. And uh, one of the... Uh, nicest memories of, uh, of Bison was that once a year, they would have uh, a, a whole uh, group of uh, 50 to 100 uh, combine harvesters. And they would start driving towards the border with Belarus. And uh, they would have uh, the, the Belarus farmers waiting at the border to jump on those machines and then drive them to their own farms. And this would be a tradition every year that, uh, you know, uh, 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 everybody would know about, and there would be thousands of people waiting on the side of the road, uh, waiting to see all these machines driving towards Belarus. Another interesting machine is uh, cotton picker. And this one on the left uh, is a case uh, a cotton picker. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very complex machine. And uh, 
it allows basically to 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 collect the the, the cotton and then to store it in the in the back here um, I don't know if you are aware, but the, the cotton picking is something that uh, uh, when it was done by hand was, was, uh, was not the, the nicest job to, to do. It eh? was, uh, was, um, was difficult and uh, was, was, uh, 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 people were also exposed to, 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 to cutting their hands to, to, and uh, uh, the, the introduction of cotton pickers has made uh, 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 a, a incredible change because they, first of all, the, the cotton pickers can pick much, much faster than, than uh, farmers could do or individuals could do. And then at the same time, it's, it's totally safe. Uh, the tractor on the side is uh, also a case the tractor which has been modified with um, the elimination of the front axle and putting only a single wheel uh, this for particular crop treatments, uh, sometimes they need to do it. And uh, this one in particular is, uh, is a bit more modern tractor with uh, a, a modern cab, uh, which uh, nowadays the cabs are uh, almost similar to the, to the inside of a car. So you, you, you hear very little noise, even if uh, outside the machinery can be fairly noisy. Uh, and uh, the last one is uh, a cane harvester. So this machine is used to, to uh, cut the cane. And uh, I don't know if you can see it up here, but basically the, the, the machine cuts the cane in small pieces. So it's already, it's uh, easier to, to transport and uh, it's also ready then to be processed. And this is a, a tradition of Australia because all the coast of Australia uh, and north of Brisbane has, uh, has a very, very large uh, area where uh, uh, sugar cane is, uh, is harvested. And uh, today it's uh, uh, the, the one of the first machines was an Australian one, Ostoft, which then has been bought by, by by other companies. So the Ostoff machine is not there anymore, but there are all the major manufacturers, John Deere, uh, Case uh, International, they have their own uh, cane harvester. Uh, once again, uh, uh, the, the two jobs that uh, were very dangerous or, and were very painful for, for workers were uh, picking the cotton and cutting the the, the, the canes and uh, they, they um, historically they've been always depicted as, as very dangerous jobs. In particular, a, a cane harvester, it's always associated with the presence of snakes uh, and, uh, and um, uh, uh, was very risky to, to, to uh, cut the, the, the cane by hand. But nowadays, basically everybody does it with these machines which are extremely powerful, very big engines, because the power needed to, to cut the cane is, uh, is, is very high. So that's, that's basically it. Um, I don't have a large collection at the moment, but uh, I, I, I am just uh, filling my box and slowly I will decide what to do with, the, with all the stamps, all the scholars. I collect uh, stamps showing uh, science fiction, comics, and anime. So I'll show you some of the more recent items that have appeared. Uh, this is the British issue for Star Trek that was issued uh, in the fall of last year, which was somewhat controversial because the Royal, a lot of collectors have been accusing Royal Mail of issuing too many stamps, and especially too many stamps that have nothing to do with Britain. So when Royal Mail issued this Star Trek issue last fall, of course, Stamps Magazine and other British magazines criticized it for being yet another British issue commemorating an American movie or TV show, right? Uh, Royal Mail did defend itself by saying that, uh, that six of the 12 actors depicted here are British. So at least 50% of the actors depicted are British, right? So, uh, so you can see that these are all uh, 
Star Trek characters from all the different Star Trek spin-offs that have been on TV. Now, in addition to these sheet stamps, uh, which are lick and stick, you, they're satanat, and they, they come in sheets. There was also a uh, self-adhesive souvenir sheet of stamps. At least on the souvenir sheet, all the actors depicted here are from the UK, right? So these are the British actors. These are more British actors. There, there's Malcolm McDowell, who some of you may remember from the, the Clockwork Orange, uh, but he, he was in that, he, he, was in, he, he, he tried to kill Captain Kirk in one of the Star Trek movies. Right? And uh, you can see there's, there's a, uh, the, the British Philatelic Bureau in, uh, in Edinburgh has this uh, Starfleet logo for its cancel. Now, this was the typical a large British commemorative set. Uh, not only were there the Satanet sat sat uh, sheet stamps and the souvenir sheet, but there was also a booklet of Machen Head definitives combined with, uh, with Star Trek stamps and a prestige booklet, of course, and then a limited edition prestige booklet and uh, a sheet of smiler stamps. You know, smiler stamps are the ones with the personalized labels beside them. And each of those labels had a Star Trek had an image on it. And if that wasn't enough, uh, there were uh, two Royal Mail postmarks, one in London, one in Edinburgh, and several uh, sponsored postmarks. So it, uh, as usual, British collectors and science fiction collectors complain, but it costs a lot of money to get one of everything, right? But this is, uh, this is Royal Mayo's issue regarding Star Trek. Now, then, uh, then Royal Mail also issued a series of stamps for DC Comics. Again, there was, uh, there was some sort of controversy that, uh, again, this was not really a British themed issue. Uh, they did justify it by saying that the uh, artist who drew all these images was a Briton who now lives in the United States. So they justified it on that basis. And uh, you can see the, these are all the familiar characters from the DC comics. Uh, you know, you recognize a lot of them, Batman, uh, there's Robin, Batgirl, right? uh, Catwoman, right? Joker, right? I don't have to go through the names, all of them. Uh, there, there, there's, there's an interesting one. This is the first stamp ever to show Nightwing, which is a Robin grown up and moved away from Wayne Manor. And also the first stamp ever to show Alfred, the butler at Wayne Manor. Again, not only were there a bunch of sheet stamps, Satan it on over two different sheets, but there was a souvenir sheet as well of self-adhesive stamps. And this is where you have a Wonder Woman, Superman. So these are the more popular characters. And uh, the, the other familiar characters, like a female Green Lantern, right? So again, uh, this is Royal Mail. And you can see the postmark, the first day of issue postmark is the Wonder Woman logo. Right. Okay, now moving right along, uh, there are three countries in the world that are now using the, their personalized postage format to create definitive, uh, to create some commemorative stamps. Uh, Australia has been using the personalized postage format to create commemorative stamps, sometimes with foreign science fiction themes like the Mandalorian or Star Wars, right? And they sell these in you know, nice attractive folders. Uh, Japan is doing the same thing too. It had it used its personalized stamp format to create a sheet of stamps showing Sailor Moon characters. Those are characters from a famous anime show from the 1990s. Right? And Portugal is another country that's been using the pers its personalized stamp format to create commemorative stamps. I have to do some research to find out why are these companies using the personalized stamp format to create commemoratives? Uh, I suspect the reason is that uh, they can issue the stamps in smaller quantities because they might think that a general issue uh, might not sell 
might, might not sell to the general public very well, but if they use a personalized stamp format, they can print a smaller quantity and target it directly to a certain collector group. Right? So uh, these are three booklets using the four stamp personalized stamp booklet format that Portugal uses showing DC Comics characters. These came out in 2020 uh, over a space of the year. So they started with uh, four stamps showing Harley Quinn, then followed up with the Joker, then followed up with a booklet stamp showing the Flash. These are DC Comics characters, right? And then they also had stamps showing Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. And um, I, I, I forgot to scan them, but each of these booklets came with a first day of issue cancellation with the logo of these characters. And then uh, in the fall of 2020, uh, actually, yeah, August 24th, uh, Portugal came out with a general issue of stamps depicting the, uh, the DC Comics characters. So there's Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, The Flash, and uh, uh, Cyborg. Uh, so this is not in the personalized stamp format. This was, you know, mass produced sheet stamps. Uh, so they must have thought that uh, there was a market for these amongst the general public. And more recently, uh, late last year, uh, Portugal came out with these Game of Thrones stamps in an eight stamp personalized stamp booklet form. Now I find this very curious. First, the uh, Game of Thrones isn't even made in Portugal. It, it's made in the United States and Northern Ireland and uh, uh, someplace in Croatia. Right? So there's no real connection to Portugal. On the other hand, the DC comic stamps didn't have a connection to Portugal either. The other thing I find interesting is that uh, all the words are in English, right? So it says Game of Thrones and all the slogans are in English. These are all the uh, logos or emblems of the different royal families in Game of Thrones. And, you know, the slogans are all in English. Uh, Portugal seems to be appealing to their own science fiction market too, because every year Portugal comes out with a booklet of personalized stamps, uh, again, stamps using the personalized book format to commemorate the uh, Portugal Comic-Con in Lisbon every year. It's their, it's their big science fiction convention. Uh, those don't show characters, though. They usually show slogans, uh, you know, related to uh, science fiction or wearing costumes. Right? And oftentimes the slogans are in English as well. So I guess a lot of the Portuguese science, uh, a lot of people in Europe are multilingual. That's, that, that's no surprise. And I guess their science fiction fans uh, know all the right slogans from all the American TV shows. Right? And there's the first day cover for the Portuguese Game of Thrones stamps. Right? And you can see the, uh, the postmarks has the Game of Thrones logo in English. And uh, there I am with George R. R. Martin, the creator of Game of Thrones at the World Science Fiction Convention in San Jose, California in 2018. Okay, so as you've figured out, and you've probably known this for a while, I collect uh, science fiction, comics, and anime on stamps, and uh, these are the more recent acquisitions I've made. <laughs>